Hey everybody, welcome to another model building workshop. Yes, I'm Mr. Allen. I'm talking to you from my basement here in Providence, Rhode Island. I'm doing this on behalf of the Smithfield Library, which is part of the Community Libraries of Providence. And today, yes, we're going to be talking about French tanks uh, from Heller. And we're going to be talking about this particular one right here, the R35 on this lovely mug. <laughs> And I'm going to talk about that one, the H35, Hotchkiss, and the Samwa S35. And these are all the Heller versions, which came out in the 70s, and we're going to be talking about them. And uh, they've all been pretty much reissued by other uh, companies now, or I should say tackled by other companies like Tamiya and uh, Hobby Boss. And we'll get to those in another episode, I hope. But today we're going to look at the old guys from Heller. Mm -hmm. So, this is the R35, and this particular marking example here is in Italian, and this served in Sicily in 1943 when the Allies invaded Sicily. There was a battalion of R35s in use with the Italian army. These were ex-French, you know, captured vehicles that found their way to Sicily as part of the defense there. Uh, Italy had a number of units that were in Sicily defending the island, although they had kind of bought a false uh, invasion plan or whatever. They were thinking that the invasion was going to be going to Sardinia and not Sicily. At least that was one thought that was on their minds. So a lot of units ended up over in Sardinia and uh, therefore some of these older tanks were, were sitting defending Sicily. Of course there wasn't a whole lot left to the Italian armored units after their defeat in North Africa anyway so they kind of used what they had. And this particular example here which is also on my mug was one that was knocked out by the British in Sicily and there's others which I'll show you in a moment that were knocked out by the Americans after a struggle in the town of Jela, or Jela, I think it's Jela, when the U.S. Rangers landed and suddenly found themselves up against tanks that they weren't expecting. So, yeah, this one here with what we now know as the Ferrari logo, but back in time, that uh, horse there prancing horse was the symbol of a fighter pilot of the name of Baraka and then ended up getting it that was from World War One, and ended up getting adopted by a lot of different units during World War Two, and uh, and then later became part of Ferrari's line so here you go here's the again these is the versions that were in Sicily so the R-35 was an infantry tank designed by the French uh, a competition was put out in the mid 30s for a new uh, tank to replace the now venerable uh, FT-17 which was the first tank out there uh, that came out in World War One at a rotating turret. But the R-35 had its pros and cons and one of the things that was good about it is that it did have like 40 millimeters worth of armor on it. So you know it was kind of a tough little nut to crack in the 1930s. Uh, not so much later, although as the American Rangers found out in, in Sicily, it was still like, okay, what are we going to do with this? We just landed. We don't have a whole lot of good equipment. Eventually, they managed to get some satchel charges that they dropped on top of the engine decks <laughs> from a building, you know, as it rolled down the street. And another one, I think they knocked out with a 37 millimeter cannon that they were able to wheel up for the beaches. So, um, yeah, interesting story there. So it had its pros and cons. So it was a pretty well armored vehicle. Uh, so that offered a lot of protection, but it was only armed with a 37 millimeter gun and, and a machine gun. And the original 37 millimeter guns were uh, not very good. They were kind of more for infantry support and were basically the same cannon uh, that was in the FT-17 anyway, or not much better. And while I got this book out, this is a fantastic book 
by Chris Ellis. I know it's an oldie, and I've had this for a long time. I know I've brought it onto uh, these YouTube videos before. But it does show you some really cool other options of the Renault, including this one here, which is the R40 with a completely different suspension system there. Yeah. And I think that might be available on resin for those of you out there that really want to track that baby down. That's kind of intriguing. So, so this is an infantry tank meant to basically march along with infantry and uh, take on strong points, machine guns, nests, and that sort of thing. It wasn't really designed for tank versus tank fighting, but it found itself having to do that uh, with the German invasion in 1940. And it was not terribly well equipped for that task. But there are a lot of issues with the French tanks, which, you know, I think we've talked about it before in this episode, and you probably know this from your own uh, research. But for those of you who don't, I'll quickly point them out that uh, this is a two-man tank. The French tended to like two-man tanks. One for the economy version, because it's pretty cheap to do a two-man. But there are problems with that in that you get a driver, and then you've got the guy in the turret, but the guy in the turret is suddenly tasked with trying to command the tank, trying to load the gun, fire the gun, aim the gun, and look for targets. And if he's the commander of the unit, he's going to do that all by himself, which is an awful lot of work for one guy to do. Um, but hey, you know, uh, so you had that problem, and there's no radio in this. So communication was done. You can see this little tiny bump on the back of the turret there. You see that? They would stick flags out of that little tiny hole there and they would signal each other with flags. Can you imagine trying to do that in the heat of a battle? Not only, you know, is it inconvenient, but you're putting a flag up and you're hoping through these little vision slits, because the other tanks in this unit also going to have the one guy hanging out in that turret and he's going to be looking at everything and trying to look for the flag like, oh, we're doing that now. Um, oof. Tough going there. But there were battles where these tanks did manage to do okay. Um, I think it was the Battle of Stun, or Stone, uh, S-T-O-N-N-E, -N -N -E, where things actually went pretty well for the French in that battle, but that got completely eclipsed by the fact that the rest of the front was collapsing as the Germans were invading. But there were times when these things did work. So again, this is the Italian version here with the Italian markings. And then you have a later version. This is the, uh, the R39, in which we got a stronger, still a 37 millimeter gun, but this one's got uh, a much better hitting power than the uh, VH35. This is a few years later. Where we, we upgraded the engine, made it a little stronger, and we put that harder hitting cannon in there. So now it got a little bit of a chance of, uh, of fighting and surviving, well, I mean, it did have thick armor, so it did it did have that going for it. But uh, this gave it a little bit more of a punch. And this one is in the markings. I mean, there's a standard, kind of standard French symbols, but this particular one, if you can see, there's a little poppy thing here. So this was a free Polish brigade, fresh from the loss in Poland, went to France, formed an, a new unit there and fought in the Battle for France. And uh, so that's what this one represents. So during that competition we talked about earlier in the 30s, you know, it wasn't just, you know, the Renault that was up for it. Here's another fantastic book. If you really like French tanks, which I find them fascinating, just because they look like something out of Buck Rogers, <laughs> yeah, more so than you know, modern combat. They, they look oddly bizarre in my mind, and I think that's the charm and what's interesting about building models of them. But this gives you an interesting breakdown of all the fascinating ways you can paint one of these tanks. Because, boy, that's a painter's dream or a nightmare, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, these two here that I have are single color because they're in use for you know, like I said, one is Italy and the other one was a Polish unit and just very simple 
green, but you can get really colorful painting these things. And then you had others in that category, you know, the FCM 36 here, which is really Buck Rogers in my mind, uh, or Star Wars. You painted that thing in a Star Wars colors because it looks like something out of that. And then you have the H35, the Hotchkiss version, which is here as well. But the Hotchkiss tank tended to be used more as a cavalry tank. So it was lighter with the armament and at a faster speed. So we could move along and do quicker hit and run type actions as opposed to the lumbering R35. So Heller decided they would make that kit as well. And here she is. This is one I built quite a long time ago. This is the H35. You're going to see it's got the same uh, uh, turret and the same 37 millimeter gun. It's just the running gear is different. If you can see that. So the R35, let's get one back up here again. Has different running gear, see? Although they tend to use a spring uh, and scissors type suspension. You know, it's got the exhaust pipe there. There are some differences between this one and the, uh, the later H3839, which I have one of those here as well, which I'll show you. So there's this one. And with this odd paint scheme, actually, this usually was a unit commander if the turret was different than the body. That usually went to a unit commander. So, just excuse my stomach if you can hear it because I'm a bit hungry. <laughs> but I wanted to make sure we got this video to give you the content you need to watch. Just being thoughtful of you. So here's another of the H35s here. Actually, I'm sorry, this is an H39. This has the different engine deck, which tends not to slope down as much. And you can see it has that bigger gun, which was introduced a little bit later. That's more of a uh, hitting power than the other one. And you can see that the, try to get these two together, that the exhaust pipe situation is different. The engine deck, so I'll put these two together here. So the exhaust pipes are different on these. Sorry here, I'm trying to, not doing the best of jobs here tonight. So, and also where the spare road wheel is in a different position. Anyway. <laughs> the R35 and 39 don't have that great of a difference in how they're laid out. It's really all about the gun on these, but the R40, as I showed you a minute ago, is a completely different suspension, which they thought would be more effective. And while we're at it, I'm going to show you this diorama here of one of the H35s, because with all of the French uh, tanks and vehicles that survived the Blitzkrieg of 1940, they quickly fell into German hands, and the Germans generally use anything they got their hands on because they were the great recyclers <laughs> of the period and they were certainly going to make use of anything they could get their hands on. And so H-35s tended to find their way to smaller units and were used in police type roles, anti-partisan warfare like this example that my nephew had put together here in this diorama um, that I helped them with um, and it shows them fighting in Yugoslavia against the partisans. So, so a lot of these ended up in German hands. Though in many cases, they later got rid of this bubble dome here and put in a, uh, they cut it down and put opening hatches, which gave better visibility for the commanders as opposed to this bubble thing and these vision ports. So yes, many of these ended up in German hands, and I showed you some ended up with the Italians, 
A number of R-35s also found their way into other armies like Romania. And Romania did pretty well with them for a while, even though they absolutely detested the vehicle. <laughs> but they did uh, the Battle of Odessa. There is a case of them storming Russian trenches and able to overrun them as the Russians didn't have anything to prevent you know, armored vehicles in that particular case, in that particular battle. So they won the day in that particular battle. And another one here we have from Heller. Oops. I said to cut some masking tape. My previous project still on the bench here. And this is the S-35, which is a medium tank. This is a 47 millimeter gun and a machine gun. This actually has a three-man crew, which is a big step up. So it's got a driver and it's got a radio guy. Well, not a radio guy. I guess there would be a radio guy if there was a radio. This one doesn't have one. Some of them did, though. Uh, but they have another guy here that could also act as a loader and an assistant. So, and then there's the commander in the turret by himself. But at least he's got some help with a loader. Um, they, uh, <coughs> blah, blah, blah. This is a cavalry tank. So this was meant for more high-speed tank versus tank fighting. This has a good gun, it's got good armor on it, it's got good speed. Generally a pretty decent tank, other than, you know, the usual lack of radio and a lot of work for the commander, although he does have assistance, it's still not the greatest, but this is definitely a run for the money, uh, and has a chance against the, the German tanks. It's actually performed pretty well, and this was a headache for the Germans, because this... This was a good tank overall for, for the time period, and it did do a number on a lot of the German armor. Um, it just does suffer a few issues where it's got bolted on armor on the top. If you can look there, you'll see the bolts. Not the best idea. And it's got these mud guards, so you know fixing the wheels would be complicated. If you ever had a problem, because you've got all of that mud god armor there, although that was very common in the 30s. But the problem with the bolts is if you hit this thing just right, as the Germans learned to do, you would hit it at the seam and it would crack the armor open. Not good, open like a can opener because of the bolts. But overall, this was a tank that the Germans feared because this thing could do some serious damage. And while we're at it, here we also have this fun little motorcycle, which sometimes came with these Heller kits. I don't know if I can put that in my hand well so you can see it. Yeah, yeah I guess like that. <laughs> so, this is a kit you could buy separately, but sometimes it came with some of these vehicles when they were boxed and the many different ways they were uh, packaged over the years which i'll give you a quick look at that too before we go so here's an example of how heller kits go together so here is the uh instruction sheet for the samoa here now granted i'm looking forward to trying the tamiya ones and seeing how they go together because tamiya has such a beautiful way of the kits just falling together and going together so nicely uh, Heller, I'm not going to lie, these are definitely not for novice model builders. These take some doing, and it seemed to me that you no, know, I have two hands, but I could have used another two to hold these things together when I'm building them, because it tends to be a lot of flat panels. So here's the Samwa's, you know, very busy suspension system. And it, there's no tub for the hull. It's all done in separate panels. And you have a crew. If you want to put a crew in there, you could put the driver, sit him in there. You can see it by opening the, the hatch in the front. I don't know. I got this one open. You, can, you can't really see it, though, to be honest. I, I need a flashlight to get in there. But that does mean you have to have those figures ready to go first, you know, painted and ready. Because once you get this thing going, you, 
you kind of have to put this entire, you know, not only do you, I, I found in these cases, you not only did you have to put the whole tub together, you needed to get the top of the hole, you need to get that entire body together quickly and get it all compact and locked in place and let it dry because it's so easy to get one thing slightly out of center and offline and the whole thing goes to rubbish bin at that point. So, to sound very British, but yeah, that's how it tended to work with these things. I found I kind of had to speed up and build a lot of the tank in one sitting to make sure it all lined up. So yeah, it's kind of busy construction. Ugh. My stomach's growling. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, you see what I mean? And these had the vinyl tracks, which uh, for the summer it, it's okay because you don't see much of it, and you and it tends to it tends to fit all right. Uh, these tracks tend to be a bit on the tight side, so you got to make sure that your suspension is glued and dried and let it sit for a while before trying to put those rubber band tracks on because it's going to bend anything out of shape if it's not cemented and solidly dried, okay? The turrets have issues in that... Well, I gathered from, you know, reviews I've read of these is that the turrets, the shapes are not quite 100% accurate. I mean, okay. Um, you can take that into account, certainly. Uh, I gathered the new versions of these kits by other manufacturers have fixed those issues. As a model builder, um, what I find is that the way the gun goes together, there's a little uh, plastic rod, which holds the thing together and into the turret to make it go up and down. I managed to get it to work on the Samwer, but it is very difficult to get that type of assembly to work on these smaller R35s and H35s. To make the gun elevate is nearly impossible. Um, or maybe it's just me, and I, as you can see, I built a number of these, and I don't think I have any one of them, no, with an elevating gun, no. I did... Uh, Managed to get them in and straight because they can want to wander off. So there's a lot of lining up with that. You you have to get that. Pay attention. And you have the option if you want to open up the turrets to, in the, the French tank fashion and put the commander sitting out of the back. So that's an option. The figures are okay, but... You know, these days there are manufacturers that are making much better versions of French tank crews, so you may want to look at that option if you wanted to do that. And see, and if you waited and did it like this and till the end to put all that together, you may find it's not going to line up. So, yeah, you kind of need to get the whole top and bottom, I find, together quickly, and then maybe then go back in and put all these other little detail pieces on afterwards. But that's just, that's my opinion. <laughs> Take it as you will. So let's look at some of the boxings of these things, shall we? So here's an R35 kit. Uh, I'm not sure what year this is. But I know I bought this mm, in the last five years, I think. I know the pandemic made things a little complicated. Yeah, because this one also gives you the Hotchkiss cannon as a bonus. If you can read that. So you get the tank and that cool Hotchkiss gun. And it's also with the same deal with this ancient boxing of the Hotchkiss tank. It also gives you the cannon, as you can see. This is pretty old, and I guess in the 70s. So I know I bought this new a few few years ago. I got this in, in Canada, Montreal. So 
where Heller stuff is a little more popular with the French speaking <laughs> Montreal and Quebec. So I'll give you a quick peek at the instruction sheets here. Again, they do like their books. And there's two of them. Okay. Not sure why. Wow, I, <laughs> I'm really hungry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so one thing that's nice here is that at least in the newer versions, when I give you the paint breakdowns, it's not just the paint numbers. So for Heller Humbrol, but they at least write out what they are. And then they have a pretty, you know, a better looking guide for the figures and how to paint them is there. So it, well, I was going to say it's an improvement, and then we get into this where it, it just gets, whoa. Yeah. So it starts getting busy and complicated right away. They have a lot of symbols for don't paint, you know, glue, don't glue, you know, options. If you're going to do it with a hatch open, hatch closed, guy inside, guy not inside. So there's a lot to pay attention to here. Yeah, that just gets to be busy. And they do give you minimal decals. I don't know if you can see that. Which was something, well, we'll look at the other Hotchkiss one, but it tended to be that they tended to give these really minimal decals for quite a while with this kit. Granted, in a lot of cases, the uh, Renault, since it was an infantry tank, sometimes didn't have a lot of markings, but as I showed you in the other book earlier, there's still a lot of colorful paint schemes. And then you get into the crew for the Hotchkiss gun. How to build that, and then you have you know, how to put the gun together. So, lots of fun options there, and a nice blow up of the parks trees, which I think is kind of cool, done by photograph. And again, with the rubber band tracks. I'm gonna go off the script for a second and talk well about like this. This is one for the Hotchkiss. This is H39 tracks. So you can use this, which I did on one of those H35, H39s. So they have that link by link track because the rubber ones are not so great. And that's the same you can do, although these get pricey for the uh, model casting gets, gets expensive and you can see by the price tag there. That it kind of is, uh, but it makes a huge difference. Um, I, mean, I don't know if you can see it from there too well, but here's the rubber tracks. Oops. And they kind of wanted to get spongy on me. In fact, I've got to wait in this tank to help hold it down. But this one has the link by length which I think is a huge improvement. Yeah, it's pricey, but it looks a lot better. And you have to be fighting it less. Okay, let me move on. So we just looked at this one here. And one thing I found funny, you know, because this is, like I said, that's from the 70s, I'm guessing, maybe the 80s, but I think that's the 70s, because I have one I built from the 80s had a, a nice photograph of the model on it, so it had that kind of look, not the painting. So I'm guessing that's a 70s version. And then there's this one, which came out, I would say, in the 2000s. I don't know if there's a date on the box. It does not look that way, but this was a... 
a newer box than yeah but what jumps out at you when you see this kit no what markings is this in it's in the german markings now so there's a whole series of these kits that have been released like i said within the 2000s that depict it in the german markings and this is a deliberate marketing ploy because despite you know tammy and hobby boss getting into the you know the french tank scene and, and doing all their variants of it and i guess selling pretty well but generally speaking at least in the united states and for those of you who are viewers from overseas i would really appreciate your comments on this but i find in the united states that this will sell because it's got german markings and there's an interest in german armor but that french yeah the demand and interest in french anything other than food i mean i'm being really but i'm within the hobby industry anyway um <laughs> you know french models french you know stuff in world war ii is just not that big of a thing i guess for a long list of reasons but i think they're fascinating but model builders the, the the standard generic american model builders that do tanks like obviously the american vehicles they like the german vehicles and maybe they'll go and do a russian one and then the british mm, is is there too but then uh france italy and the other countries yeah they kind of dribble down uh, to the bottom it just the interest isn't really there by you know i'm not saying it's not it that it's not existent it is but but there's a reason that they went with this packaging to sell this model and let's take a look at how they've got this one very quick you know because here's some of the actually these are extra parts from the kit but this is your, your crew and yes you end up with a lot of extra pieces when you build these things because you get many variants but anyway is an example of what you're dealing with and you get the two types of engine decks to work with and you get two types of you see at the top uh idler wheels depending on which version you do so and let's just wrap this up by looking at the <laughs> i'm coming unglued <laughs> the instruction sheet and i'm like Please they made an attempt to clean this up a bit on how they're doing it. Yes, yeah, is a, a bit better. But as you can see, looking at that hull assembly, there's a lot of individual pieces that you really want to make sure you get that whole box together, glued and dried, before you move on to anything else. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so for the turret, and even the back here, they're actually not telling you. Hmm. Interesting. This is strictly an instructions for the H35. They're not even mentioning that there's an H39 and all the parts in here to do the H39 is not talked about. How odd. And okay. And the markings are for the 23rd Panzer Division as it was being formed in France. So I guess they trained with the French tanks, such as this, uh, Hotchkiss, before they were equipped with uh, Panzer III's and so forth and sent over to the Stalingrad front. And that's it. Interesting that they don't get into 
the other variant here. What else is there? So it makes me wonder. All right, bear with me. We're almost there, folks. I appreciate your patience. All right, this thing's a bunch of loose pages. Yeah. <laughs> but this does give you the two versions and probably one of the worst painting guides I've ever seen. <laughs> but, you know, this is a very colorful option because they give you an H35. You know, which has got some really nice uh, emblems on it. I know the unit, but I can't think of it off the top of my uh, head how to pronounce it. Or, um, But this cavalry unit, and it's got this wonderful badge. And it's got the big roundels on it. And there's another version, which has shown up a lot of photographs for the German army anyway. C captured ones of this particular version was number 64, which the Germans knocked out. And... Oof. text all right so there's your English instructions written out Ooh, that's grim again this one gives you the cannon so here's the crew but a very busy old instruction sheet for that all right, this is all falling apart here but yeah. They're all loose pages. But again, all right, I'll just show, show you this and we'll stop here. But it does show you, you have two options for the turret, for H35 and H39. And that's going to lead me to believe, I don't want to go too crazy, because I think I've used up enough of your time. But yeah, it also talks about, no, this is actually together, but it does talk about the two different engine decks that would go for those two different vehicles. Anyway, I think... I think we've covered this topic. So these are the <laughs> Heller's versions of the French tanks that they've been marketing since the 70s. Okay. <laughs> they're fun to do, but they are a challenge. Um, but they're probably a lot cheaper than the newer versions that are out by Hobby Wars and Tamiya. Something to think about. Okay, guys. Keep building and have a good time. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Bye.